So today, uh, my topic is exploring distributed and distributed denial of service. It's a mouthful, I know. The distributed and then distributed denial of service. Uh, so we will be talking about the social engineering aspects of an anonymous style distributed denial of service attack. Uh, like uh, I was previously introduced, my name is Adnan. And uh, the goal of the presentation today is to provide you with an understanding of what denial of service attacks are and how Anonymous uses them. So I'm assuming that Anonymous, uh, being the hacktivist organization, is not a new name for uh, the attendees here. And you are familiar with the goals and objectives and targets uh, they have uh, done in the past. This gives you a brief abstract of uh, what we are going to talk about today. So my goal after this talk is, if you can take away a few things from this talk, would be what DOS or DDoS is. It's a very common type of attack. It's one of the most common tools in the hacker's arsenal. We tend to think, we always tend to think that there will be more sophisticated attacks, uh, but that's really the case. Denial of service is a very brute force way of bringing a system down, and that is used by uh, most of the hacktivist organizations out there. Now, the social media and the social presence makes it really easy for these uh, hacktivist organizations to accomplish that, and we'll see how it, it works and um, how social media platforms help them uh, use these uh, kind of attacks and, and uh, uh, use these platforms to kind of uh, <clears throat> use the social aspect of these platforms and distribute these attacks across multiple different devices, including the mobile devices, as well as um, the desktop devices available for all. So this is a, a brief bio um, about uh, what we, uh, a brief of my background. And uh, we will talk some uh, socio technical aspects of uh, distributed denial of service. And feel free to ask any questions uh, and interrupt in the uh, in the meantime, if you want to have any, you have any questions in the middle. A little bit, bit about, I would put um, a little bit about OWASP. OWASP is Open Web Application Security Project. It's an organization which provides security related information. Uh, it's a nonprofit organization which provides security related information to uh, different companies and different organizations. So it's a really uh, good resource for um, technical as well as non technical folks to go and then see what different kind of web application vulnerabilities are out there. Um, and this is available in OWASP.org. Um, I'm a member of this organization. Uh, we have a chapter here in Los Angeles, as well as in other uh, major cities as well. And they meet uh, once a month. So that was a little plug about OWASP. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about what distributed denial of service is and how they work. So distributed denial of service, essentially, is uh, a challenge for the network and data center operators since the very early days of the internet. Uh, the trend is sure to continue as you know more companies move to the web-based, mobile, and especially the cloud computing architecture. Um, in fact, what happens is the DDoS attack services are now getting advertised online uh, for as little as dollar five per hour. And I have a slide deck which actually shows one of these ads which talk about how you can uh, pretty much uh, do a DDoS on somebody's site uh, with, with different various different modules for, for five bucks. So like I said, this presentation essentially defines the socio-technical context of this anonymous hacker socio-political movement. And it's more technical and less socio-political due to my background, but I'll try to uh, get into the details of how, how it works for uh, uh, for the social pol political aspect of it, so this um, essentially the hack uh, the anonymous movement draws ideas from the hacker manifesto 2.0 that suggested that the advent of the the whole new economic system with the new technological vectors like uh, technological vectors essentially means the mediums of communication uh, the new new forms of communication so the movement is apparently you know pushing forth the the advent of this whole new information regime in which the abstraction of the ideas, like how you abstract ideas, as a surplus economic value, uh, where you can tap this value. So these 
uh, these folks essentially style themselves as fighters against the government tyranny, and they're pushing hard against the interna international regime of intellectual property and information control uh, by government and corporations. And the example which is mostly cited, a canonical example which is cited, is, uh, is that uh, internet is controlled uh, by these large organizations of government. It's not in its, it's supposed to be in its root a very distributed, a very people own things versus um, now it's now owned and controlled by the government and corporations. And you will see whenever there is any kind of, uh, um, any, any kind of uh, uh, control related issues happening, Anonymous jumps in and, and they will try to take over and they will try to um, address those issues with uh, different type of attacks on the organizations which are involved in those things. So today the topic is, is going to be very, uh, are very uh, focused on uh, application layer DDoS. So th there is actually a, a way of uh, handling it on the network layer, but I will uh, keep it focused towards application layer and how you uh, can can define your applications to to be more uh, <coughs> better work against uh, distributed denial of service attacks. So uh, th there is a network aspect to it. Uh, which is from a data center and the network perspective, but uh, we will talk about how applications are. So there's a big application portion and there's a big network portion. Okay, so let's move on. So, so what I like is that social media makes it easy to perform denial of service attacks. Okay, so any of these uh, networks you can see on the reference side, the Facebooks, the YouTube, the blogger network, the Twitter sphere, uh, LinkedIn, your Reddit, um, all of these different uh, social media outlets allow you to be able to post different things and share. And your right side, if you will see this little green piece of code, it it is the bad piece of code. This is the code which can be used for a pe for an attacker to be able to gain access to your um, system to be able to uh, to see to be able to post. So for example, I'll give an example of Sammy Worm in um, MySpace. So MySpace, uh, there is this person, he actually lives in LA. Uh, he built this worm called Semi Worm, and that was one of the first worms which hit uh, Facebook. It used a type of attack called cross-site scripting attack. And essentially, he, wa he was lonely. He wanted to have friends. So what he did, he wrote this uh, JS script and uh, posted it in one of the uh, Facebook, co uh, sorry, MySpace comments. MySpace did not do a good job at uh, cleaning up their their comments of JavaScript, so he was able to inject that. And essentially, that what that what that bot did, what the JavaScript did, is it sit in there and it will add all the people in this, uh, the friends friends list to his list, and then post that same thing on all the other friends pages. And the same thing will happen to all the friends. So he will automatically be able to accumulate a bunch of uh, friends, so he's not lonely anymore. But now, all of a sudden, he has a lot of friends. So this will spike as an activity. But you will see. I mean, MySpace has cleaned up and removed this exploit for a long time ago, about I think a couple of years ago. But now, still, you will see on Facebook and other places if you click on some some video to watch or some picture to see, and all of a sudden you have liked that picture and it it has uh, now appears on your on your wall, which is not what you want it to do, right? So this is one way of how you can um, think of uh, social media makes it easy for people to attack. Um, so how does it all gather together in, in the idea of uh, a denial of service and how, how would it cause denial of service? So let's talk a little bit about what denial of service is. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, denial of service attack overloads computing on network resources with so much traffic that you know, legitimate users are unable to gain access. Any computing service uh, which is accessible via the internet is potentially subject to a denial of service attack or a distributed denial of service attack, including mm -hmm. websites, web applications, email, um, any of the URI, REST for URI. So, but it, it gets worse. When distributed denial of service is primarily an attack um, which happens on something, it's essentially an attack not on, the, on a vulnerability, but more of an availability of a service. So it stops the service from available, so as you can, as you, as you have seen, I will show in a few future slides. The recent events has shown that DDoS is being used in combination with other types of cybercrime to facilitate even the information theft. 
So once the system is compromised in terms of availability, we can use it to do um, like authorization bypasses. So by deviating the parameter def uh, defenses through the denial of distributed denial of service, um, attackers now can gain access to resources inside the network. Right? So now the authorization and authentication um, has been degraded. So you can uh, use that to uh, gain resources inside the net network. And then uh, you'll see how this can be used in a social media context. So when we uh, see in a bit how Anonymous did it, anatomy of his attack, you will see how um, it can essentially uh, uh, tune into this the distributed aspect. Uh, if you know, want to know more about distributed denial of service or denial of service attack, uh, there's this uh, tutorial. I have uh, the screenshot of it here, and I've already provided the PDF, so you can take a look at it. So as the social media for follows through, the attack services now increase. Now you have all of these different places. Previously, if you had to attack, do a distributed denial of service, you would have to send out emails to a bunch of people, uh, spam a bunch of people. But now instead of spamming, you have this post these social media where so you can tweet it, you can Facebook it, you can uh, post it on LinkedIn, you can do a bunch of different places where you can give this URI out and people will start using it. You can use block comments. You can write a bot which will leave tons of block comments on different, different blocks. So there's basically attack surface has significantly increased. As you can see here in this uh, graph, the over two thirds of the smartphone and tablet owners do not protect their devices from viruses and malware. So that's another aspect of this thing. It's just besides just posting a URI to people and sending them uh, uh, pictures of cute kittens to your friends, you can now see that uh, people have a potential threat against malware as well, where they can uh, we are, they are not protecting against malware, and they will uh, they may potentially become zombie machines now, providing that mobile nowadays has a full capacity of doing all what a traditional computer used to be able to do. So this is going to become a big threat in that area. So it hasn't been uh, escaped the the hacker community that this is a really good area for doing attacks. So what they have done is they have done done toolkits, built toolkits which target this type of attack. So there's a a tool called Havage in Imperva report. I've um, put, provided a link for that. Um, Imperva has done really significant amount of work, and I have referenced a lot of their work in my slides here. Uh, they talk about Havage, which is a tool built in, uh, potentially built in Iran, and uh, that does a SQL injection attack on different uh, places. Uh, uh, it actually looks at your site or look at your web asset, and then it uh, figures out the schema. The database schema against you, and then it uses that to build um, attack vector and do a SQL injection attack. But you see this uh, a low IC, the low orbit iron can. That's one of the attacks where you can provide a target URI and then use that as an attack vector. And one of the sites you will see, uh, Reddit, one of the very much used websites for uh, nerds, I would say, <laughs> in um, um, on the uh, internet, and that has been. Uh, attacked by DDoS, as you will see in the screenshot. Now, uh, these are some few of the screenshots of uh, DDoS attacks in Q2 2011, how it's on the rise, using social network for DDoS, Reddit as a hacker tool, causing a DDoS with social media, no botnet required. So now, uh, uh, this is just to emphasize that it's really easy now to be able to um, utilize the social media aspect. And, and provide a distributed denial of service attack. Now, when I said denial of service, it, it's fairly as easy as making a request to a website. That is your service request. If you distribute that service request to a bunch of different computers, what you are doing is you now you're compromising the availability of the, that system because it won't be able to serve all of these requests. And hence, it's going to cause a denial of service. Now, what better medium is then use social media for causing this kind of attack. So in recent years, you will see the websites and mobile banking services have been a target of this. Um, they have been disrupted by denial of service attack. Uh, in this uh, picture over here, um, you will see that uh, distributed uh, attacks are increasing in 2012. It's a bit smaller here, but I'm sure you will be able to get the slide deck um, from Jay, and then we can essentially use this to um, to, to, to see it in a, in a bigger shape. But all of the, these links, if you want to be able to know what essentially is, is happening, I have a references section at the end, and you can see um, the references for all of these different attacks. Uh, financial sector is especially vulnerable for this area, where um, 
a distributed NASA so service attack has been um, caused lately. Uh, there was a there was an attack on Visa and Mastercard, where um, a NASA service that was brought on and was able to bring down their their services for a while. Um, now there is this uh, really great socio political aspect of this discussed in uh, this report collection potential as um, extrapolating an ideology from an anonymous hacker socio political movement and they talk um, in great detail about their how they do handle the socio political aspect of this I am not necessarily um, qualified to to talk about this topic specifically but those who are interested can get this report from this URL down here I could not include this report in the proceedings because it is um, because of copyright restrictions uh, but you can essentially get it from this URL at the bottom uh, they didn't seem any any issues with that URL it's um, uh, from Kansas State University that you are so um, but this uh, I'll, I'll share a few doc few um, figures from this report and, and the features for example uh, this if you look at uh, this uh, block diagram it talks about different aspects of hacktivism ranges for instance you can see that um, organization how it uh, goes from non-violent calls to action to the type of hacker attacks and what it results in right so you have virtual community organizations and you have petitions and you have boycotts and things like this which are very non-violent calls to calls to action however when you see the the hacker attacks it is MITM, which is one of the very famous type of attacks. If you want to steal somebody's information, it's called man in the middle attack. Then there is spear phishing, which means that there's a term called phishing, P H I S I H I N G, which means you go and uh, send somebody an email, like you know everybody gets an email from the Prince of Nigeria, and you you always have to respond to the Prince of Nigeria. You can't tell him no, I'm not going to email it back to you know, the Prince. So you send him back and give you your account number and social security and tell him I am. Uh, Send transfer the funds, and I'm still waiting for my funds. I haven't got them. So, uh, but if you have these attacks targeted, those are called spear phishing. So, for example, if I get an email with my name and and something related to me, that means it's uh, being targeted to me, and that may that actually gives more potential to attack than anything else. Now, in that email, there might be an iframe, which has um, a, an outbound request. It is making an outbound request to a bank website and doing a transfer. Or this may be a maybe a mass mail sent to a thousand of mobile devices where friends or other people will just open it and they don't really know that they are essentially making an outbound call to a bank's website and causing a denial of service attack. And that is the beauty or horror of the denial of service attack. But it, it allows normal people to be able to participate in it without them knowing what's going on. Also, the traditional means by which you can do an IP blocking or you can do uh, say okay, I would not accept requests from AOL or from this place. So you can't really do that because now it's mobile. Now tons of people from tons of different IPs from tons of different carriers are hitting your site, and you can't differentiate between legitimate users and illegitimate users that easily. It, it, that is why um, denial of service attacks are a hard problem to solve. So this gives you a, a kind of a, a hacktivism range of how they attack. Now. This buckyball is also from the same paper, and I highly recommend you take a look at it. Um, it will give you a good overview of, uh, of more social aspects of, of hacking. This talks about how anarchists and hackers and anti-security uh, folks kind of uh, bind together, and what are the recursive relationship between ideologies and, and actions corresponding to those. Now, going back to anonymous and what they did. Um, like I was talking about earlier, they did not use much sophisticated techniques. Uh, I mean, they definitely could uh, probably do some, uh, but that requires a lot of work. So here they did uh, recruiting. Uh, this is the cycle. So day one to eighteen is the first phase, essentially recruiting and communication, and then they go reconnaissance and application attack. So they do um, SQL injection attack. And if you look at the Imperva report, uh, where this uh, screenshot is from, you will see further details of this uh, these phases. I unfortunately don't have enough time to go into further details of these. Um, now, uh, reconnaissance application attack, and then the day 22nd is when they start doing a denial of service, distributed denial of service. And you see that day 24, 25, distributed denial of service increases, and that brings in a lot of um, availability issues for these companies. So they, they will just distribute, they will prepare the, the folks, they will prepare this whole. So, for example, they have this, this is their anonymous IRC channel, this is essentially their Twitter feed. And this Twitter feed will allow uh, distribute this URI uh, to a bunch of people, and then they will be able to say, "Okay, now this is a the URI. Now go ahead and visit it, and this will bring down 
these are master class. Now, one of the challenges which you, we encounter here in uh, in this uh, distributed denial of service attack is that when people are, are visiting these URIs from multiple different machines, it's not a server side attack, which means you can't just bring down one server and then say, okay, that's it. Now the attack would not happen, which was possible in the classical way when we had the zombie nets or um, a dark internet and we will have some zombie machines sitting down and you will just go and bring those machines down or stop um, requests from those. But now every every browser itself is a machine is actually making a jQuery call or a, or a URI, RESTful URI call, which can which has a potential of bringing down your, your system. So that's why. And this is... Uh, from the same report and it talks about the community graph and how the different vertices and edges are, are connected together. So uh, like I said, this is a very interesting paper you probably want to look at. Now, these are a few more screenshots talk about how anonymous, anonymous hacks CBH in universal music and um, only takes a click to be a part of anonymous attack. Like I was mentioning earlier, if you want to click on this URL, you'll see more of these kind of uh, uh, news. But it only one, takes one click to be a part of anonymous attack because now you essentially can have um, a hidden iframe, um, a page which is making, making a jQuery request outbound to a, a bank site or any potential asset where uh, which they want to bring down. So you can probably get a very legitimate page. You go over there, the page is compromised and may, is, is not doing anything to your machine, but may, doing a distributed denial of service to a different machine. So that's one of the, the things uh, you'll see. So this is a, a very um, good report, report, and I have provided the links here, uh, which talks about how the YouTube videos, as you can see here, and uh, uh, Twitter accounts were used in the reconnaissance. And this is something which is of interest to this community, because this community is essentially more focused towards the, how socially they uh, interact and reach out to these people. So the social media spectrum and the likely-minded places of, um, of um, a uh, hacktivist community is what is what targets us, and you can see a uh, bunch of different places where these kind of uh, discussions take place, including um, Reddit or uh, other internet forums. You will see. Uh, so these videos gets posted, and they had like millions of views. Uh, and uh, any URI on that uh, on these videos will be clickable, and then you have essentially distributed it across the spectrum to cause a distributed denial of service attack. Um, these are Further details, um, unfortunately, I don't think you can see it in, in detail unless you open up the report, but you'll see that uh, in here, the graph of the request has gone up on the second page. It's significantly up. On the left side of the page, you'll see pie charts of IPs and what IPs are coming from which different places and how they, they change. And as uh, Anonymous says, uh, we are anonymous. Uh, we are a legion. We do not forgive. We do not forget. Expect us. That's one of their quotes. So, the IP distribution kind of reflects that because you will see it, it coming from all over the place. Um, I mean, there is a definitely a pattern uh, for this uh, in terms of URI, and you can uh, network users who do deep packet analysis can inspect and, and uh, target this, but it's hard. It's not as easy as uh, blocking a generic IP. So further on, um, as you'll see on the left side, there is a, a service attack. Um, and it talks about the attack vector, and as you'll see on the right side, the tools available for doing this attack, and the whole entire report is available as a, as a PDF on Imperva's website, as well as the resource material, so you can take a look at it. Uh, but um, it, if you are interested in knowing the detailed aspect of how the attack happened, uh, this actually is more of a technical side of the things, and the earlier PDF I pointed to is more of a socio-political side of, of this. Uh, there's another uh, really good uh, paper out there called Anti-Social Network, turning a social network into a botnet. So um, that's also worth reading um, if you're interested. And it's also should be available as part of the download package. So now let's talk about um, what type of volunteers are used for anonymous hackers. Um, they're skilled hackers and they're lay people. And lay people are essentially the focus of this whole social network reach outreach. So these people um, do an outreach. Uh, I mean, it, it isn't said that, especially you know, in today's age of the globalized communication, no amount of force you know, can kill uh, this kind of inspiration. It's a, essentially a potential source of the counter-mobilization, especially you know, if it's spread through an informal network, like um, operating below the radar of uh, state bureaucracy, it's uh, um, the, the social network. So if it's um, uh, lay people who can um, 
have a group of quite large ranging from anything from a few dozen to a few hundred volunteers and they are providing information by skilled hackers like applications uh, they will be able to uh, implement a distributed denial of service attack fairly easily so this is uh, for the details of how the recruiting and uh, communication phase happens and then um, the custom attacks uh, with multiple different software so here is uh, they have actually built so they use uh, they use the specific hackers the people with skills to be able to build these different um, applications. And, and those are not necessarily executables where you download from a website and run it on your machine. It, it's, it is as simple as just visiting a web page. And that is uh, uh, the ease of how you can perform this kind of an service attack. Um, and then you, know, you can see here it says uh, PC Apple mobile device to perform an attack by virtue of just having a web browser. And that's, uh, that's how easily it can be performed. And this is a screenshot I was talking about earlier, where it is uh, promoted that you can buy a DDoS service. And they accept web money or web thing, but they don't accept PayPal. So I guess that's a lot of luck. All right. So I think we are uh, kind of running out of time. And I would like to give some time for the question and answer so you have an um, idea of where we're going with this. And if there are any further uh, detailed uh, uh, reviews are needed for any specific topic. I'll be more than well, um, happy to do this again. Um, how can companies and you can um, prepare it with the uh, developer education and you can make sure that all of your OWASP top 10 and SANS and other security is, is uh, addressed and also your social media presence. So you also monitor and uh, make sure that your social media presence is um, monitored or it has alerts against it, so you know that if uh, you know anything is being said against your corporation, it uh, you have that level of understanding that it, it is out there. Also, just traditional security, transport layer security, application layer security is in place. Uh, implementing a service-oriented architecture where you can have um, implementation at multiple different levels uh, can be isolated and fault isolated, and uh, bringing down one sort of one part of the system does not impact the other part of the system. Um, just uh, building fault isolation zones is one of the greatest strategies to be able to accomplish this. Um, this is another diagram of explaining how service or architecture works. Uh, this is um, how you would be able to solve your network layer attack. So there is another notion of software-based, uh, uh, um, uh, software-defined networks, SDNs, and that's uh, the new buzz in uh, network community. So uh, there are various different uh, vendors including Juniper and Cisco for building these SDN based machines which can help us toward these uh, denial of service attacks or distributed denial of service attacks. Developer education like I said is uh, really important as you can see in front of the, uh, this car there's a SQL injection based, um, <coughs> based uh, query here and that is, a, that is an attempt to drop a table if a camera takes a picture of this, this car and uh, it will try to do a SQL injection, hoping that the developer has not sanitized the input. So uh, these are the references of uh, different things we talked about, including the Hacker Intelligence Initiative uh, Monthly Trend Report, um, Intelligence Summary, some of the things I went over are part of this. And I know I went over too fast, but uh, there was a lot of material and um, a lot of things to talk about. So that's why I thought I would give you a glimpse of this world. And if you find it interesting, then I'll be more than happy to, to talk about it again. So feel free to check out these uh, reports and feel free to um, ask any questions you may have. Thank you very much. And uh, for everybody online, if you could go ahead and type your questions in the, the chat box at the bottom of your screen. I have a few that are sent to us from uh, email if you have the, the time for it. Uh, I'd also like to remind folks that the the documents that uh, Mr. Masood has, has referenced here and some other interesting ones are available for download in the download pod on the left-hand side of your screen. So I urge you to pull those out and uh, find out some more information there. Uh, Mr. Masood, a question here. Uh, since mobile devices are everywhere nowadays, particularly uh, they're, they're just about the primary uh, mode of communication for places outside the U.S. and throughout the, the Arab world, how do you see that social media integration with mobile devices playing out uh, in these uh, denial of service attacks? Uh, that's uh, 
that's a very relevant question. Uh, as you see the uh, in the earlier slides, I've talked about all you need essentially is now a mobile device to be able to accomplish it. And uh, which you'll see in news reports, if you just uh, Google or Bing, um, mobile DDoS, you will see an alarming number of new attacks are now going to be uh, mobile based. So that is why it's becoming much more common to use mobile device and social media to do this. So for instance, if you are at, um, at, at a place where there's a gathering and uh, uh, you would like to promote your message, what better place is to have a hashtag and, um, and tweet that message. And essentially, that is very accessible across entire uh, uh, Twitter sphere, as well as all the followers. And then when they visit that link, they'll be able to uh, not only, I mean, it could be informative, and it can also be cause a denial of service. So uh, mobile is the next venue, next, next phase of these type of attacks. OK, yeah. And uh, traditional techniques like IP blocking, I get why, uh, because it's a distributed kind of attack, I kind of understand why that works. Do you have, uh, are, are there other traditional things that, that are being tried that, uh, that are either very successful or very unsuccess unsuccessful? Uh, so traditional techniques are useful in, in various ways, uh, but they don't always work against. So uh, let, let, me, let me rephrase that. The, the reason why traditional techniques don't always work is because of the distributed nature of the attacks, because the attacks are so distributed um, across the spectrum of uh, multiple different IPs, multiple different geographic locations. Uh, it's, it's hard to pinpoint and use a traditional IPS, uh, the intrusion detection system or intrusion protection system, against these type of attacks. So, they, they are not, I'm not saying they're useless, but they um, have to be modified to cope with specific attacks. So for example, a traditional te technique in finance and banking is to be able to block IPs or put a spe specific restriction against IPs coming in from Eastern Europe or other, other countries which have um, more higher fraud potential. However, uh, you can restrict those things against specific functionalities after the authorization for most of the, the financial institution based transactions. However, you can't accomplish the same thing if you are trying to uh, work with uh, these type of attacks because these are essentially trying to just access pre-authorization. Um, and then you, if you block this, you will essentially block the entire uh, legitimate user base as well. So I, I think that's, if I remember, that's called uh, geographic targeting or, or IP range blocking. Is that correct? That's right. Okay. So how effective are those really? I mean, can if since these are so distributed, uh, how can can a regime or a, a corporation really block these kinds of attacks? Uh, so. So, well, they are useful to a certain extent. I think they can actually be, uh, you need a dynamic system, essentially. You need uh, systems which learn from the patterns. And that's what SDNs are very useful for the software-defined networks will be able to accomplish that. Because the currently system, if you have a static rule-based system, which will say, OK, if the threshold goes higher below this, block this IP. Those kind of uh, systems are not as useful, because now your thresholds are not going above for a particular IP. It's thresholds coming from a bunch of different IPs, a bunch of different assets. Um, how would you be able to block it when you don't have uh, an identifying component, right? So you can't completely block traffic from everybody else either. So the, the system needs to do a bit more uh, deep packet analysis to identify the type of your uh, of your attack and, and uh, what kind of resource is being accessed and if they are changing the, the template of the resource which is being accessed. And that's where it, it comes down to. Also, another uh, the social aspect of this thing would be when people can try to access this URI, and they will say, OK, these URIs are being accessed. And these URIs are the same ones which are also published on Twitter. And we have also seen in the darknet or other places where these URIs were published, and so that people are able to access it. So you can put a specific measures against those URIs. URIs are the, essentially the web addresses. So you can um, put a specific rules, but it will be on the fly because nobody's going to be able to monitor and keep all of those things uh, updated all the time. So this will be, uh, this will be more of a, a dynamic um, attack vector than the systems which will evolve to cope with those dynamic nature of the attack vectors. 
Okay, just a couple more if you have the time. Now that I'm thoroughly nervous about this entire thing, generally speaking, how vulnerable are our systems uh, to these kinds of attacks? Okay, <laughs> we uh, tend to be, the security people tend to be to portray this whole, uh, the doomsday scenario all the time, but it's not uh, doomsday, it's, it's realistic, right? Wherever we see these attacks happening, like our financial institution, major financial institutions, major banks, had this, this problem. Now, there are two aspects of this. Uh, one is our, um, the, the for money, like for cyber crime style aspect of these things, where people try to do phishing attacks to be able to harvest accounts and be able to do fraudulent activities. And the second is the hacktivist um, side of it, where people are, are doing it for a hacktivism um, perspective. So. Uh, for both sides, you will see that when people have attempted, uh, when criminals have attempted to do these kind of cyber crime activities, you will see that they have been able to compromise tons of accounts. We have examples from uh, multiple different banks. Uh, you, you can look in the uh, SANS wall of shame and, and then see tons of different related elements, uh, 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 entities, uh, large financial institutions um, being able to being hit by this. Now, what we don't have statistics on, for the most part, is how our um, other utilities and other sector is vulnerable to this. Because I, I haven't been, uh, I haven't done research into finding how much uh, data is available for these kind of attacks against our infrastructure, our grids, our um, utilities, other um, public related items. So, uh, I mean, this is an open area where we can look into. But definitely, I mean, these, these vulnerabilities are application layer vulnerabilities, and they're hard to protect. So anything on the internet is vulnerable to this. And uh, us being uh, our target of this is a normal thing. So uh, you will see in the previous slides, you will see in these uh, documents and the links that these are pretty much happening, and we have to work to, to fix those. Okay, hey, yeah, here's a question from, uh, from our online audience. Uh, and this is particularly relevant in this because this is an evolving uh, field and this is a, a threat uh, picture that we really don't have a good handle on. What is your take on how the U.S. government and international law uh, are adapting and handling this kind of cyber law issue? Um, okay. Uh, so I'm a, I'm a technologist. Uh, as a software technologist, my take on this is it's uh, intellectual property protection and uh, laws uh, will always be, of course, you know, behind what people are, are trying to accomplish. And it's hard to, to legalize these aspects. So for instance, if my, I receive an email from a friend, hey, look at this cute cat picture, and essentially that is a denial of service attack. Behind the scenes, there's an iframe, which is making a request to Visa or um, or any of the U.S. government asset website, which is essentially I'm just looking at a cat video or a cat picture, and and behind the scenes is making a, a recursive call to some something else, right? It's a it's a behind the scenes kind of attack. How liable I am to the this kind of attack? Am I did I did it on purpose? So so proving the intent and uh, involvement of the people, and uh, it, it's going to be a hard problem to to solve uh, from a legalization perspective of the of the things. I think uh, what we can do uh, from our part is a better job at monitoring, a uh, better job at uh, pattern tracking of these things, uh, utilizing machine learning, utilizing automated means of uh, monitoring and uh, doing a sentiment analysis. That's a very, um, very, I mean, evolving field in this area, uh, sentiment analysis, which can which can pretty much point out to the assets which are getting targeted or in verge of being targeted. and uh, Though that would might be a, a better way to, to approach it. Um, I'm not really familiar as much about the, the legal side of this, so I might not be qualified to answer this, but uh, that kind of sums up my, my opinion. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, do you have any closing comments before we uh, leave out here? So I have my email address over here and uh, my blog post and my LinkedIn. Uh, so if you have any questions, comments, if you want me to do a, a, a second part of this, if you have any specific comments about any of this, any, any of the things we have spoken here, feel free to reach out. And uh, it was a great thing talking to all of you. So it stops the service from available. So as you, can, as you have seen, I will show in a few future slides, the recent events have shown 
that DDoS is being used in combination with other types of cybercrime to facilitate even the information theft. So once a system is compromised in terms of availability, you can use it to do um, like authorization bypasses. So by deviating the parameter def uh, defenses to the denial of distributed denial of service, um, attackers now can gain access to resources inside the network. Right? So now the authorization and authentication um, has been degraded. So you can uh, use that to uh, gain resources inside the net network. And then uh, you'll see how this can be used in a social media context. So when we uh, see in a bit how Anonymous did it, an anatomy of his attack, you will see how um, it can essentially uh, uh, tune into this the distributed aspect. Uh, if you want to know more about distributed denial of service or denial of service attack, uh, there is this uh, tutorial. I have uh, the screenshot of it here, and I have already provided the PDF, so you can take a look at it. So as the social media for, follows through, the attack services now increase. Now you have all of these different places. Previously, if you had to attack, do a distributed denial of service, you would have to send out emails to a bunch of people, uh, spam a bunch of people. But now instead of spamming, you have this Post is social media where so you can tweet it, you can Facebook it, you can uh, post it on LinkedIn, you can do a bunch of different places where you can give this URI out and people will start using it. You can use block comments. You can write a bot which will leave tons of block comments on different different blocks. So there's basically attack surface has significantly increased. As you can see here in this uh, graph, the over two thirds of the smartphone and tablet owners do not protect their devices from viruses and malware. So that's another aspect of this thing. It's just besides just posting a URI to people and sending them uh, uh, pictures of cute kittens to your friends, you can now see that uh, people have a potential threat against malware as well, where they can uh, we are they are not protecting against malware, and they will uh, they may potentially become zombie machines now, providing that mobile nowadays has a full capacity of doing all what a traditional computer used to be able to do. So this is going to become a big threat in that area. So it hasn't been uh, escaped the the hacker community that this is a really good area for doing attacks. So what they have done is they have been done toolkits, build toolkits which target this type of attack. So there's a a tool called Havage in Imperva report. I've um, put, provided a link for that. Um, Imperva has done really significant amount of work, and I have referenced a lot of their work in my slides here. Uh, they talk about Havage, which is a tool built in, uh, potentially built in Iran, and uh, that does a SQL injection attack on different uh, places. Uh, uh, it actually looks at your site or look at your web asset, and then it uh, figures out the schema. The database schema against you, and then it uses that to build um, attack vector and do a SQL injection attack. But you see this uh, a low IC, the low orbit iron can. That's last. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about what distributed denial of service is and how they work. So distributed denial of service essentially is uh, a challenge for the network and data center operators since the very early days of internet. Uh, the trend is sure to continue as you know more companies move to the web-based mobile and especially the cloud computing architecture. Um, in fact, what happens is the DDoS attack services are now getting advertised online uh, for as little as dollar five per hour. And I have a slide deck which actually shows one of these ads, which talk about how you can uh, pretty much uh, do a DDoS on somebody's site uh, with with different various different modules for, for five bucks. So like I said, this presentation essentially defines the socio-technical context of this anonymous hacker socio-political movement. And it's more technical and less socio-political due to my background. But I'll try to uh, get into the details of how, how it works for, uh, uh, for the socio-political aspect of it. So this um, essentially. The hack, uh, the anonymous movement draws ideas from the Hacker Manifesto 2.0. This suggested that the advent of the, the whole new economic system with the new technological vectors, like uh, technological vectors essentially means the mediums of communication, uh, the new, new forms of communication. So the movement is apparently you know, pushing forth the, the advent of this whole new information regime in which the abstraction of the ideas, like how you abstract ideas, as a surplus economic value, uh, where you can tap this value. So these 
these folks essentially style themselves as fighters against the government tyranny, and they're pushing hard against the inter international regime of intellectual property and information control uh, by government and corporations. And the example which is mostly cited, economical example which is cited, is, uh, is that uh, internet is controlled uh, by these large organizations, the government. It's not in its, it's supposed to be in its route a very distributed, a very people owned things versus um, now it's now owned and controlled by the government and corporations. And you will see whenever there is any kind of, uh, uh, any, any kind of uh, uh, control related issues happening, Anonymous jumps in and, and they will try to take over and they will try to um, address those issues with. Uh, different type of attacks on the organizations which are involved in those things. So today the topic is is going to be very uh, uh, very uh, focused on uh, application layer DDoS. So th there is actually a, a way of uh, handling it on the network layer, but I will uh, keep it focused towards application layer and how you uh, can can define your applications to to be more uh, <coughs> better. Uh, work against uh, distributed denial of service attacks. So uh, th there's a network aspect to it. Excellent. So today uh, my topic is exploring distributed and distributed denial of service. It's a mouthful, I know. The distributed and then distributed denial of service. Uh, so we will be talking about the social engineering aspects of an anonymous style distributed denial of service attack. Uh, like uh, I was previously introduced, my name is Adnan, and uh, the goal of the presentation today is to provide you with an understanding of what denial of service attacks are and how Anonymous uses them. So I'm assuming that Anonymous, uh, being the hacktivist organization, is not a new name for uh, the attendees here, and you are familiar with the goals and objectives and targets uh, they have uh, done in the past. This gives you a brief abstract of uh, what we are going to talk about today. So my goal after this talk is, if you can take away a few things from this talk, would be what DOS or DDoS is. It's a very common type of attack. It's one of the most common tools in the hacker's arsenal. We tend to think, we always tend to think that there will be more sophisticated attacks uh, but that's really the case. Denial of service is a very brute force way of bringing a system down, and that is used by uh, most of the hacktivist organizations out there. Now, the social media and the social presence makes it really easy for these uh, hacktivist organizations to accomplish that, and we will see how it, it works and um, how social media platforms help them uh, use these uh, kind of attacks and, and uh, uh, use these platforms to kind of uh, <clears throat> use the social aspect of these platforms and distribute these attacks across multiple different devices, including the mobile devices as well as uh, the desktop devices available for all. So this is a, a brief bio um, about uh, what we, uh, um, a brief of my background, and uh, we will talk some uh, social technical aspects of uh, distributed denial of service. And feel free to ask any questions uh, and interrupt in the, uh, in the meantime if you want to have any, you have any questions in the middle. A little bit, bit about, I would put um, a little bit about OWASP. OWASP is Open Web Application Security Project. It's an organization which provides security related information. Uh, it's a nonprofit organization which provides security related information to uh, different companies and different organizations. So it's a really uh, good resource for um, technical as well as non-technical folks to go and then see what different kind of web application vulnerabilities are out there. Um, and this is available in OWASP.org. Um, I'm a member of this organization. Uh, we have a chapter here in Los Angeles as well as in other uh, major cities as well. And they meet uh, once a month. So that was a little plug about OWASP, uh, which is from a data center and the network perspective, but uh, we will talk about how applications are. So there's a big application portion and there's a big network portion. Okay, so let's move on. So, so what I like is that social media makes it easy to perform denial of service. 
attacks. Okay, so any of these uh, networks you can see on the reference side, the Facebooks, the YouTube, the blogger network, the Twitter sphere, uh, LinkedIn, your Reddit, um, all of these different uh, social media outlets allow you to be able to post different things and share. And your right side, if you'll see this little green piece of code, it it is the bad piece of code. This is the code which can be used for a pe for an attacker to be able to gain access to your uh, system to be able to uh, to see to be able to post. So for example, I'll give an example of Sammy Worm in uh, MySpace. So MySpace, uh, there is this person, he actually lives in LA, uh, he built this worm called Sammy Worm, and that was one of the first worms which hit uh, Facebook. It used a type of attack called cross-site scripting attack. And essentially, he, wa he was lonely, he wanted to have friends. So what he did, he wrote this uh, JS script and uh, posted it in one of the uh, Facebook, co uh, sorry, MySpace comments. MySpace did not do a good job at uh, cleaning up their, their comments of JavaScript. So he was able to inject that. And essentially that what, that, what that bot did, what the JavaScript did, is it sit in there and it will add all the people in this, the friends, friends list to his list and then post that same thing on all the other friends' pages. And the same thing will happen to all the friends. So he will automatically be able to accumulate a bunch of uh, friends, so he's not lonely anymore, but now all of a sudden he has a lot of friends. So this will spike as an activity, but you will see, I mean, MySpace has cleaned up and removed this exploit a long time ago, about I think a couple of years ago. But now you still you will see on Facebook and other places where you click on some, some video to watch or some picture to see and all of a sudden you have liked that picture and it it has uh, now appears on your on your wall, which is not what you want it to do, right? So this is one way of how you can um, think of uh, social media makes it easy for people to attack. Um, so how does it all gather together in, in the idea of uh, a denial of service and how, how would it cause denial of service? So let's talk a little bit about what denial of service is. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, denial of service attack overloads computing on network resources with so much traffic that you know, legitimate users are unable to gain access. Any computing service uh, which is accessible via the internet is potentially subject to a denial of service attack or a distributed denial of service attack, including mm -hmm. websites, web applications, email, um, any of the URI, REST for URI. So, but it, it gets worse. When distributed denial of service is a primarily an attack um, which happens on something, it's essentially an attack not on, the, on a vulnerability, but more of an availability of a service one of the attacks where you can provide a target URI and then use that as an attack vector. And one of the sites you will see, uh, Reddit, one of the very much used websites for uh, nerds, I would say, <laughs> in um, um, on the uh, internet. And that has been uh, attacked by DDoS, as you will see in the screenshot. Now, uh, these are some few of the screenshots of uh, DDoS attacks in Q2 2011, Harris on the rise, using social network for DDoS, Reddit as a hacker tool, causing a DDoS with social media, no botnet required. So now, uh, this is just to emphasize that it's really easy now to be able to um, utilize the social media aspect and, and provide a distributed denial of service attack. Now, when I said denial of service, it, it's fairly as easy as making a request to a website. That is your service request. If you distribute that service request to a bunch of different computers, what you are doing is you now you're compromising the availability of the, that system because it won't be able to serve all of these requests, and hence it's going to cause a denial of service. Now, what better medium is then use social media for causing this kind of attack? So, in the recent years, you will see the websites and mobile banking services have been a target of this. Um, they have been disrupted by denial of service attack. Uh, in this uh, picture over here, um, you will see that uh, distributed. Uh, attacks are increasing in 2012. It's a bit smaller here, but I'm sure you will be able to get the slide deck um, from Jay, and then you can essentially use this to um, to, 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 to see it in a, in a bigger shape. But all of the, these links, if you want to be able to know what essentially is, is happening, I have a references section at the end, and you can see um, the references for all of these different attacks. Uh, financial sector is especially vulnerable for this area, where um, a distributed access service attack has been um, caused lately. Uh, there was a there was an attack on Visa and Mastercard 
where um, a denial service that was brought on and was able to bring down their, their services for a while. Um, now, there is this uh, really great socio-political aspect of this discussed in uh, this report called Action Potential, as, um, Extrapolating an Ideology from Anonymous Hackers, Socio-Political Movement. And they talk um, in great detail about their how they do handle the socio-political aspect of this. I am not necessarily um, qualified to, to talk about this topic specifically, but those who are interested can get this report from this URL down here. I could not include this report in the proceedings because it is um, because of copyright restrictions, uh, but you can essentially get it from this URL at the bottom. Uh, they didn't see any, any issues with that URL. It's um, uh, from Kansas State University, that URL. So, um, but this, uh, I'll, I'll share a few doc, few um, figures from this report and, and the features. For example, uh, this, if you look at uh, this uh, block diagram, it talks about different aspects of hacktivism ranges. For instance, you can see that um, organization, how